This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This is the last chapter in the series, Tarnished Hollywood. In this episode, I'll share a story about a promising young actor who ran afoul of the law. His decision to immerse himself in gang culture at the expense of an acting career would lead to a life sentence in a prison cell and a brutal and bizarre end to his life at the age of 36. This is the tragic story of Lloyd Avery II. At Lloyd Avery II's double murder trial in 2001, Los Angeles County Deputy District Attorney Hoon Chun opened by telling the jury this. You've heard the phrase, art imitating life. Well, this is a case about life imitating and even exceeding art. Jury members would wonder how Lloyd Avery, a young man from a stable-loving family who attended Beverly Hills High School, and was handed a plum role in an Academy Award-nominated film, came to find himself on trial for his life on a gang-related murder charge. The answer, while not definitive, might be summed up as a combination of hubris and the need Avery had to live up to the perception of others. It's a strange story that could have only come out of Hollywood. Lloyd Fernandez Avery II was born on June 21, 1969, to Linda and Lloyd Avery. His father ran a home repair and construction business. His mother stayed home to raise her four children in a middle-class neighborhood of southwest Los Angeles known as the Black Beverly Hills. Lloyd was of mixed-race ancestry, African-American and Mexican. He was a good-looking boy with a mischievous smile, big brown eyes, and long eyelashes. He was known as the class clown, who played baseball and water polo at Beverly Hills High School. The Averys raised their sons, Lloyd II, Che, and Zanjay, and their daughter, Tico, to value education and love the Lord. The Averys were Christians who read the Bible and made prayer a part of their everyday lives. Lloyd's classmates at Beverly Hills High included the children of the rich and famous, including singer Smokey Robinson and music producer Quincy Jones. We were silver spoon kids, Lloyd's younger brother, Che, says. We never needed for anything. After graduating from high school, Lloyd attended Los Angeles Trade Technical College. His father hoped his sons might follow in his footsteps and work alongside him in his construction business. But Lloyd didn't aspire to build anything, unless it was a musical career. He'd grown up during the first exciting days of musical artists who were blowing up the industry in the genres of rap and hip-hop, artists like Run DMC, Public Enemy, and Ice-T. Lloyd began creating beats on an SP-1200 digital drum machine. His father disapproved of Lloyd's interest in music, and they argued bitterly about it. Lloyd Sr. destroyed his son's drum machine to put an end to what he considered a frivolous pursuit. But Lloyd was a headstrong and stubborn young man and would always follow his own path, even when it veered dangerously off course. He was always his own person and was known to be an attention seeker. Lloyd also appeared to be a thrill seeker sometimes taking risks for no reason at all, other than to see if he could get away with them. As a privileged youth in Los Angeles, he was invited to weekend house parties at mansions in the Hollywood Hills. Acquaintances said one of his favorite pastimes was playing a game called Party and Pouch. Simply put, this involved stealing items from the homes, quote, just to steal shit. Lloyd also had a way of pushing people's buttons. He had a sarcastic wit, often making jokes at the expense of others. Somehow, he always knew how to zero in on his target's insecurities. This often led to arguments or even fights. Lloyd's need to be the center of attention and his smart-ass tendencies were legendary, as was his temper. Although he was the one to do the provoking, once he was confronted, he was quick to snap and would refuse to back down. Even after the situation grew heated and ugly, Lloyd seemed unfazed. 
he'd laugh off even dangerous situations and negative consequences he'd incur as a result of his behavior. In 1988, he received the first serious consequence for his actions. At the age of 19, Avery and his friends attended a party thrown by University of California at Los Angeles students in Westwood. Upon leaving the party, they were approached by a group of fraternity brothers. Avery began cracking jokes about the young men, and a fight ensued. Just as a police car approached the group, shots rang out. Avery was arrested, and although he didn't have a gun, he was found in possession of a fake ID. He was booked and spent three days in jail. Concerned, his friend Keith Davis spoke with him upon his release. He was surprised at Avery's reaction. He just laughed off the situation and told Davis that, quote, he really liked jail. How the hell do you get locked up and enjoy it? He was so flippant, end quote. Avery continued to commit petty burglaries and was arrested once again in 1990 when he was caught stealing studio equipment from a guitar center store. Mainly drifting after high school graduation, Lloyd Avery II's life would change dramatically in 1990 when he was offered a small acting role in a new film. Oddly, this opportunity didn't launch him into an acting career, but led him further into a life of crime. Soon after graduating from the University of Southern California's film school, 22-year-old John Singleton began casting his first film. Titled Boys in the Hood, it was a coming-of-age story about three friends growing up in a crime-ridden neighborhood in south-central Los Angeles. Singleton cast Cuba Gooding Jr., Ice Cube, and Morris Chestnut in the roles of three young black men trying to navigate a life filled with street violence, gang culture, and uncertain futures. Morris Chestnut plays the role of Ricky Baker, a promising football star who is shot and killed after tensions escalate with a local gang. Singleton wanted to cast mostly locals in his film to project realism. Lloyd Avery was acquainted with the director, and Singleton asked him to play a small but pivotal role in Boys. In the scene often called the most iconic in Boys in the Hood, Avery, listed in the credits as Knucklehead No. 2, is seen leaning out of the window in the back seat of a red car brandishing a sawed-off shotgun. As Ricky sees the gang members rolling up alongside him in the car, he turns to run. Avery shoots, and Ricky is fatally gunned down. Singleton worked extensively with Lloyd Avery before his scene to prepare him. He taught Avery how to hold the gun and how to embody the role of a cold-blooded gang member. Casting director Robbie Reed would later say of Avery, quote, Lloyd just had a presence that I think was undeniable. When people refer to that it factor, it's intangible. You just know it when you see it, end quote. Another actor on set was also a close friend of Singleton. He said that the shot of Avery leaning out of the window holding the gun was, quote, iconic. John was so happy when he got that shot. Boys in the Hood was a hit at the box office and a success with critics. Released in the summer of 1991, it grossed over $57 million in North America alone, and was nominated for Best Director and Best Original Screenplay at the 64th Academy Awards. Singleton became the youngest person and the first African American to be nominated for Best Director. Two years later, Singleton wrote and directed his second film. Poetic Justice was a love story starring Janet Jackson and Tupac Shakur. It received mixed reviews from critics, but still debuted at number one at the box office on its opening weekend, and ultimately earned over $27 million worldwide. Lloyd Avery was cast in a small role in Poetic Justice, as was his brother Che. Singleton wanted to nurture Avery as an actor, but Lloyd's attitude began to interfere with his acting career. At Poetic Justice's premiere, as the credits rolled, Avery stood up and in front of the entire audience criticized the director. That shit was whack, John, he yelled before storming out. Singleton ignored the insult and remarked that it was just Lloyd being Lloyd. Eventually, however, Avery would burn his bridges with the director and no longer be invited to work with him. Avery had become a legend in his neighborhood due to his role as a hardcore gang member who famously killed Ricky Baker on screen in Boys in the Hood. He was shown respect by real-life gang members who liked having a celebrity around, and Avery enjoyed the attention. Perhaps to capitalize on his fame, Avery made a surprising decision. He moved out of his middle-class neighborhood 
and into an area dominated by Blood's affiliated gang members known as the Jungle. He began hanging out with local gang leaders, even while he continued to try and further his acting career. Avery hired an agent and also began producing music. He produced the lead single titled Push on Tisha Campbell's 1993 album, Tisha. But he continued to burn bridges by pushing buttons with producers, directors, and celebrities alike. On the set of a Jet magazine photo shoot, Avery was introduced to legendary comedian Robin Harris. Minutes after meeting, Harris attacked Avery. The art director for Boys in the Hood, Brent Rollins, witnessed the altercation and said, quote, I don't know what Lloyd said to him. All I remember is that Robin Harris was choking him against a sofa. Avery found that making it as an actor involved many auditions and numerous rejections. His very first role, the one that made him a minor celebrity, had been handed to him. Now he had to pay his dues as an unknown actor among thousands of other hopefuls in Hollywood. He often showed up unprepared for auditions if he showed up at all. His music career had stalled too. He didn't receive another acting part for three years when he was cast in an uncredited role in 1996's parody film, Don't Be a Menace to South Central While Drinking Your Juice in the Hood. Avery may have decided that earning respect as an actor took too much effort. He was already shown respect by affiliating with real-life gang members who'd allowed him into their inner circle due to his celebrity status. But Avery wanted real acceptance and respect from his new peers. He began running with a subset of the Black Peace Stones gang who called themselves the Jungles. Avery began putting in work to be respected by the gang. He racked up several burglary and weapons possessions charges. By 1996, he was heavily invested in the gang lifestyle. His friend Keith Davis remembers the first time Avery revealed his affiliation with the Bloods. Quote, We were shopping at the Slauson swap meet, he said. Some rolling 60s came up and were like, You're the guy from Boys in the Hood? Yeah, that was me. You shot Ricky, right? Yeah, that was me. Hey, cuz, you really a Blood? I was looking at him like, What? Lloyd just kind of laughed. They asked him if he was a Blood, and it clicked. Yeah, I'm a Blood now. End quote. Avery even had a very distinguishable tattoo inked on his face. The word jungles was tattooed over his eyebrow. By 1999, Avery was living off small residual checks from his acting roles and couch surfing in friends and family members' homes. The LAPD had Avery on their radar as a possible drug dealer. They suspected him of supplementing his income by selling crack. He'd had to move out of the jungle after getting into an altercation with members of the Nation of Islam. His behavior began to spiral, and he often exhibited angry outbursts. Avery brandished a gun during an argument on Venice Beach's boardwalk. He got into a violent incident at a Los Angeles club, where he pulled out mace and sprayed MTV host downtown Julie Brown. His behavior was described as erratic, angry and out of control one minute, and weepy and apologetic the next. At one point, he tried to return to his faith. He'd make an attempt to attend church, but would end up changing his mind and would leave after making it as far as the church parking lot. On July 1, 1999, Lloyd Avery II, now 30 years old, happened upon two neighborhood drug dealers he was acquainted with, Annette Lewis and Percy Branch. Lewis and Branch had been involved in the drug trade in the jungle. As they sat under a tree in an L.A. plaza, Avery approached. After a short argument about an alleged drug debt, Avery pulled out a 45 caliber pistol and fired. He shot Lewis first and then turned the gun on Branch, shooting him in the stomach. Annette Lewis died later that evening. Percy Branch survived three weeks, but would ultimately succumb to his injuries. Avery was pegged as the alleged shooter, but he had no permanent address and was not picked up immediately. Amazingly, he continued to book acting work, going on to film two more movie roles after the shooting. Just two weeks later, he was on the set of Lockdown in New Mexico. The film was shot on location at the New Mexico State Penitentiary. The prison had been the site of one of the deadliest prison riots in U.S. history. Over two days in 1980, inmates took control of the prison, and 12 officers were taken hostage. Inmates who had previously worked as prison informants or had lodged complaints against other inmates were taken from their cells, tortured, and mutilated. Horrific accounts of the violence that ensued were later revealed. A blowtorch was used on one inmate's face until his head exploded from the heat. 
Another prisoner was hanged, his throat cut, and his genitals mutilated. One suspected prison informant was hanged by being thrown off a balcony. His body was then cut down, and he was decapitated with an axe. By the time the riot was quelled, 33 inmates were dead, and more than 200 were injured. None of the guards lost their lives, but some were beaten and others raped. Filming the movie at a working prison was often stressful, and the cast and crew would frequent local bars in the evening to unwind. Avery, who was often uncooperative on set with the crew, director, and cast members, didn't attend these gatherings. But one day, he got into a heated exchange with one of the lead actors, DeAndre Bonds. He began fighting with him, and a makeup artist intervened, trying to get the men to calm down. Avery turned his wrath on her. Quote, Avery said he was going to find me and my family when we got back to L.A., and that he was going to murder us, head of makeup Melanie Mills reported. Avery also decided he had a problem with one of the film's other actors, Percy Miller. Known as Master P, Miller was a rapper, record producer, and actor. Avery was now fully embodying his gang member thug persona. He menaced and threatened to kill Miller repeatedly. Avery's behavior resulted in his role being cut in several scenes, and he was ultimately thrown off the production. On the day he was fired, he was found smoking marijuana laced with PCP on the back of a grip truck. He had a stolen boombox with him. He was told to return the radio, and he flew off the handle. He ran into the hair and makeup trailer and lunged towards Melanie Mills. A tattoo artist working on the film punched Avery in the face. He was then chased off the set by Master P's entourage. Still dressed in prison garb for his role, Avery scaled a tall barbed wire fence to escape his pursuers and found himself in the penitentiary's prison yard. Sirens began to blare, and snipers in the guard towers trained their weapons on the runaway actor. One of the producers frantically called off the guards and explained the situation, probably saving Avery's life. Along with being fired from the movie, Avery was ordered to leave the state of New Mexico. Back in Los Angeles, Avery presented a script he was writing to his agent, Christine Chapman. She said it was a good script and tried to help him rally interest in it with producers. Avery became friendly with Chapman's son, an aspiring model and actor named Sean Spraker. He and Spraker became roommates. But Avery became angry during a meeting at his agent, Christine Chapman's office, and maced her. He was let go from the agency and kicked out of her son's apartment. Soon after being fired from the set of Lockdown, Avery landed a role in a promising independent film titled Shot. He would play a gangster called G-Ride. Director Roger Roth was impressed by Avery's audition. Roth said, quote, He's one of the best actors I ever worked with. He could nail every line. He could make you believe it. He could make you feel it. End quote. Roth also hired Avery to serve as a technical director on the film, which documented life on the dangerous streets of South Central L.A., something Avery was very familiar with. But Avery began to bully and threaten the director on the set, he continually threatened to kill him. Roth became afraid of the unhinged actor and took to sleeping in his secret editing office. Avery would finish filming and receive credit for the film, but it would be his last role. He bullied and abused too many people and burned too many bridges. A tip would be called in to LAPD detectives who were investigating the murders of Annette Lewis and Percy Branch. Lloyd Avery II's acting career and his freedom would soon come to an end. Do you skip meals, and then when you finally remember to eat, you just eat something that's less than nutritious and probably not very satisfying? Or is that just me? Eating better is easy with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. I love that Factor meals are fresh and never frozen. I don't want to defrost my food, you know? And each selection is chef-crafted and ready to go in two minutes. And no matter what your diet is, Factor has meals for you. Keto, Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, you name it. My go to's are Keto and Calorie Smart. Some of my favorite meals creamy Parmesan chicken with broccoli and tomatoes, and shredded chicken taco bowls with roasted corn salsa and cilantro lime sour cream. Yum. They're ready to heat and eat. No cooking and almost no cleanup. What's not to love? Factor meals are delivered right to your door on your schedule. And plans are flexible. Need more or less meals? You can modify them or reschedule your meals anytime. 
Head to factormeals.com slash once50 and use code once50 to get 50% off. That's code once50 at factormeals.com slash once50 to get 50% off. And we thank Factor for sponsoring the show. In the fall of 1999, the murders of Annette Lewis and Percy Branch were being actively investigated by LAPD detectives. Lloyd Avery II was still a person of interest who was being sought for questioning. A wanted poster went up around the city for Avery. Sean Spraker, Avery's former roommate and son of the agent he'd attacked, called in a tip to the LAPD. Lloyd Avery had moved out of Spraker's apartment and was staying at his grandmother's house near Beverly Hills. Officers began patrolling the neighborhood in search of Avery. On December 9, 1999, Avery got on his BMX bike and began riding up Crescent Heights Boulevard. Seeing a police cruiser parked on the side of the road, Avery, ever the smartass, turned his bike around and approached the officer who was sitting inside. What's up? He grinned at the officer. As the officer opened the car door, Avery took off, pedaling away as fast as he could. But he was intercepted by other police vehicles moments later. He was arrested and taken into custody and charged with the murders of Percy and Branch. While Avery was awaiting trial, he returned to his faith. Like everything he did, he jumped in with both feet and never looked back. He began attending Bible study at the county jail and became close to the senior chaplain, Dennis Clark. His faith was as real as any man's faith I've ever known, Clark would later state. Avery carried his Bible with him always and began trying to convert other inmates to follow Christ. They began calling him Baby Jesus. In December 2001, Avery's trial began. Deputy D.A. Hoon Chun said Avery had the opportunity to live a life as a successful actor or attend college and pursue another professional career like his siblings. Instead, a child of privilege and luck, he chose to gangbang and live a criminal lifestyle. He chose to live out the acting role that made him famous by murdering two people in cold blood. Avery's defense poked holes in the prosecution's case and claimed that he wasn't the shooter. The victim, Percy Branch, who'd survived the shooting for a few weeks, denied it was Avery who shot him. The prosecution's star witness was not credible, they said. The witness had asked for money in exchange for their testimony. Avery took the stand in his own defense, but his alibi was weak. He only remembered he was somewhere in Hollywood at the time of the murders. The jury found Avery guilty of two counts of first-degree murder. He was given a life sentence to be served at Pelican Bay State Prison. Pelican Bay is a supermax prison, California's highest security prison level designed to house the most violent or dangerous offenders. Avery began his sentence in March 2001. He became known as a born-again Christian who often proselytized other inmates to turn their lives over to Jesus. In August 2005, Avery was moved into a double cell with Kevin Roby, an inmate serving a life sentence for the brutal rape and murder of his sister in 1987. Roby was a paranoid schizophrenic who'd become an avowed Satanist in prison. Avery came to believe that God had placed him and Roby together so that he could save his soul. He kept preaching to Roby about Jesus, even after Roby warned him to stop. On Sunday, September 4th, just days after they became cellmates, an altercation between Roby and Avery took place in their cell. Roby choked Avery unconscious. Avery's lungs filled with blood, and he died. Roby then placed Avery on his bunk and covered him with blankets. Over the next day and a half, guards conducted 11 inmate counts, including a standing count at 4.30 p.m. the next day. Avery was always counted as present. While his corpse remained hidden in their cell, Roby enjoyed double food rations, eating Avery's portion. He even replied to a letter written by one of Avery's pen pals. Pretending he was Avery, Roby wrote flirtatious responses to the writer's inquiries. At one point, Roby tied strings to Avery's limbs, working them like a puppet master to fool the guards into believing Avery was still alive. Just before the inmate count at noon on Tuesday, Roby conducted a ritual to Satan using Avery's corpse. He drew a pentagram on the floor of the cell and placed the body in the middle. He used Avery's blood to paint the walls of the cell while he chanted prayers to his dark lord. At the next count, Avery's murder was finally revealed to the guards. Roby was handcuffed and taken out of the cell. Avery's body was taken to the infirmary, 
where he was administered CPR, even though his body was already decomposing. He was announced dead at 12.10 p.m. He'd been dead for almost 40 hours. Lloyd Avery's cause of death was reported as aspiration of blood with blunt force trauma as a contributing factor. The medical examiner speculated that the blow to the head may have been caused by the skull being slammed against the cell's stainless steel sink. Avery's family mourned his loss and called for murder charges to be filed against Roby. However, the DA's office declined to take the case to trial, stating that Roby had already confessed and was not eligible for the death penalty. He was already serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In 2007, a report conducted by the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation found that correctional officers failed to follow basic guidelines and procedures, including removing Avery's body before it was photographed as a crime scene, and, of course, failing to notice that the inmate was dead in his cell for 38 hours. Five officers were found guilty of misconduct and received disciplinary action ranging from a 5% pay cut for 45 days to a 10% pay cut for six months. Avery's mother was appalled and called it a, quote, little tap on the hand. An officer interviewed about the incident said, quote, these prisoners are assholes. These aren't nice people. He said that if a prisoner refused to stand, they're not going to push it. They just count them. We like a quiet day, he said. We cherish a quiet day. He said the officers involved didn't, quote, do it on purpose. Was it lazy? Sure, he admitted. Finally, he said, if there is any mystery here, it's why was Roby taken from a single cell status to being in a double? Who cleared it? End quote. Kevin Roby remains incarcerated at Pelican Bay. He stated that it was, quote, necessary to perform two rituals over Avery's body to fulfill a satanic prophecy. In 2020, Roby announced plans to release a book which he said would be titled The Satanic Christ, The Living World of Darkness. He said it would contain 66 chapters in six sections for a total page count of 999 pages. It's unlikely to find a publisher. Avery's life and death were described as a tragedy and a wasted opportunity by those who knew him. Director Roger Roth said, quote, When I think back on Lloyd, I think it's one of the greatest missed opportunities. Had he been able to control himself and not commit a double murder, there's no doubt he would have been a big success. Lloyd's brother Che named his youngest child after his brother to honor him. He called his brother's life and death, quote, the Tupac syndrome. He felt like he had something to prove when he really didn't. Even if you have money and fame, you will sacrifice all of that just to have respect from a bunch of thugs. Instead of just being a Hollywood-like studio gangster, he was living it. My brother turned into a for-real gangster, end quote. Until the end, Lloyd Avery II thought he could live his life any way he chose and never considered the possible consequences of those choices. In a letter dated a week before his murder, Avery wrote this about his cellmate to his friend, Chaplain Clark. Quote, I know God has me around him for some reason. He knows very well that I'm a devout Christian, and I pray for him to the Lord every day that he gives his life to God. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Make sure to follow and download the podcast on your favorite podcast app. It really helps us out. If you listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, follow Once Upon a Crime. And in Apple Podcasts, make sure your settings are on automatic download so you don't miss new episodes. To make sure, click on the three dots or ellipsis in the description box, click on Settings, scroll down to Automatic Downloads, and make sure it's set to default all new episodes. It makes a big difference for the show. Thank you so much. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Sanchez Ludlow. My executive producer is Lorena Garcia, who also helped with research for this episode. Until next time, be good to one another.